Hey folks, welcome back to another lecture in the Introduction to Earth Sciences with Dr. Matthew Wileke. I am Dr. Matthew Wileke. Please follow me at Matthew Wileke on Twitter, uh, Twitter, or X as it is now referred to. And please subscribe to my Substack, uh, irrationalfear.substack.com. Um, that's a reader supported subscription um, to news about climate change, climate science, just science in general, culture, politics, and all of the above. So this is the ninth lecture in this uh, lecture series, and we will be talking today about mountain building and deformation, one of the processes that is actually causing the surface of the earth to recycle itself. Um, it's this uplift and this mountain building that occurs, weathering strips those sediments back off, and we have this recycling of material at the earth's surface. We call that the rock cycle that we've talked about a little bit when we talked about our three different rock types, igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. And you'll see that mountain building is really intimately related with plate tectonics. Um, for example, the image that you see in front of you should be somewhat familiar as this is kind of our cartoonish figure of what we would consider a continental ocean convergent plate boundary. These two plates are coming together. The plate on the left is an oceanic crust and you can see that it is being subducted under the less dense continental crust on the right. And as those two plates come together, a few things happen. For example, magma is formed and a volcanic arc can form, but also the compression, the sense of, of motion, which is pointing in towards each other, this compressional uh, stress causes the crust to essentially thicken in the vertical direction and shorten in the horizontal direction. And thus we start to get what we consider mountains. A reminder that some of the key principles that we'll that we've already covered that we want to remind ourselves of remember our principle of superposition so this is an image in front of you of a, a bunch of sedimentary rocks that appear to be undeformed they're laid down relatively flat they don't seem to be tilted or folded in any way so this we would assume that this is an undisturbed sequence of sedimentary rocks and thus we can safely make the assumption that the rocks at the bottom near this person's feet are the oldest and the rocks at the top above their head are the youngest because nature just doesn't really have a good way of sneaking in a bunch of sediment in between two other layers. It's, it's not like a deck of cards that you could open up and slide another card into. New layers are deposited on top of old layers and thus we have this age progression that we call the principle of superposition. Remember also original horizontality. We talked about this when we talked a little bit about sedimentary rocks. This is essentially the principle that sediments need to be laid down horizontally. If you put a bunch of loose sediment onto a steep angled slope, for example, the flank of a mountain or a volcano, the next time that the rain falls or the wind blows, that sediment will be washed down the flank of the volcano and it will eventually be deposited in some area that's relatively horizontal, like a valley and then it will be subsequently buried. So the idea of original horizontality is that sediments are usually deposited in nearly horizontal layers. Well, what's that mean? That means if you come to a road cut like this, so this is from the Mojave Desert, this is actually a road cut that shows a portion of the San Andreas Fault. If you see these tilted sequences of rock, you know something must have happened subsequently to these layers being laid down horizontally. The dark layer on the left, it was likely laid down flat and all those layers on top were deposited subsequently on top. And then this whole sequence has been tilted onto its side because there's no way in this orientation could you actually stick new sediment on the side if this was the original orientation and then bury it somehow, right? So we know that by the principle of original horizontality that these sediments were likely laid down in some original horizontal position and then they've subsequently been tilted by plate tectonics or some other process that has deformed these rocks.
also if you see rocks like this in nature. So this is a nice sequence of folded rocks. We know that these rocks couldn't have been laid down like this. You can see this little peak in the middle with two valleys on the outsides. We'll talk a little bit about this, uh, more about this, but this is an anticline in the middle and two synclines on the sides. You can imagine that if the surface looked like this, then any time you laid down sediment, it would never cover the peak in the middle and it would fill in the valleys on both the right and the left. But you don't see that. You see these equal thickness layers moving all around the peak and into the valley. And again, using the principle of original horizontality, we can assume that these rocks were laid down flat and then subsequently were folded during some compressional event that was pushing these rocks together. Furthermore, if you find rocks that have been displaced in the macro sense, for example, this is an image in the upper left of a fault in China that has uh, dissected a mountain range, and we can look at the mountains in the north uh, in the upper right of that picture and in the lower left, and we can see that they are related, they're the same age, they're the same geochemistry, and they were likely evolved as a linear feature. And then subsequently, those rocks have been separated by this fault that is coming through. This is a transform fault. This is a, a, a left lateral trans strike slip fault, and it has been pushing the mountain ranges and separating them. In the smaller scale, we see this in the field all the time. For example, in the picture on the lower right, that's an image of a geologist standing next to a normal fault. You can see that kind of rocky layer above their head. It's displaced downwards to the right of them. It is about head high now. And so that is a normal fault. So anytime you're displacing rocks like this, we don't think that that's happening naturally when the rocks are being deposited. That is something that is coming in and actually doing this after the deposition of the rocks. So some fault basics to remind ourselves of. We've talked about these a little bit when we talked about earthquakes, but remember we have three senses of motion in our plate tectonics. In the upper left, we have a divergent plate boundary. Notice the arrows are pulling apart. In the upper right and the lower left, we have our convergent plate boundaries. Notice those both the arrows are pointing in. And on the bottom right, we have our strike slip fault where we don't have either compressional or tensional forces. They're, they're not coming together or pulling apart. The plates are merely sliding past one another. The first three that we just talked about, we consider dip slip faults because there's a vertical motion associated with that. Notice that in each of those, there is a fault scarp that is created. The surface, the land surface, is no longer uniform. It has now been uplifted or down dropped in certain areas. But in the lower right, in our strike slip example, there is no vertical motion. The plates are merely sliding past one, one another horizontally. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. First of all, quick little quiz. You take a look at this fault and what type of fault do you see? A really easy way to do this is to remember a fun little acronym that is fun. Footwall up normal. So you take this person and you elevate them up such that their body is splitting the fault or that the fault would be splitting their body. The rocks on the left-hand side of the fault, we would consider the head wall or the hanging wall because that's where that person's head would be. And the rocks on the right-hand side of the fault, we would consider the foot wall because that's where their feet would be. And so if we have the acronym FUN, what that means is foot wall up normal. And if you look at this gray uh, sequence of rocks in the image, you can see that the rocks in the on the foot wall side, the right hand side of the image, have moved up. So foot wall up, this is a normal fault. When we think about mountain ranges, we don't just talk call them mountains, of course, because as all scientists, we like to come up with our own terminology just to make it difficult for all you guys that are trying to follow along. We call them we call mountain belts origins or orogenic belts, and that is essentially a linear range of mountains. You may wonder why linear. Well, it's actually linear because most of these are associated with plate boundaries and plate boundaries because they are in fact the boundary where two plates are coming together are essentially defined by a line on a sphere. 
And there's about a dozen or so of these. There's a lot of smaller ones, but you can see in the center of your image there, you can see the Rocky Mountains and the, of the North America and the Rockies of, of, of Canada. Um, you can see the Appalachian Mountains on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. In the southern hemisphere in South America, you can see the nice linear feature of mountains along the western seaboard of South America that are known as the Andes. Uh, the Himalaya are on the right-hand side of the image near the Tibetan Plateau. That's our classic example of a continent-continent collision. That's why it's the tallest mountain range on the planet. But you can see that there's these general linear features that define our mountain belts. When we have a mountain building process occurring, we call that an orogeny. Kind of a funny term. We have funny shirts that say subduction leads to orogeny because, you know, we got we to gotta have some fun. But orogeny is essentially a mountain building event. And so these events can last from anywhere from uh, tens of millions of years to, to maybe just a few millions of years. Um, we'll, we'll look at a few different mountain belts to look at kind of their age. But in a, the process of building a mountain belt or building an origin, we call that an orogeny. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. So I used to be a professor at the University of Alabama. The tallest uh, mountain in Alabama is Mount Chiha at about 2,411 feet. Uh, here, now I live in Colorado. The tallest mountain in Colorado is Mount Elbert. That's 14,440 feet. It's just below the tallest mountain in the contiguous United States, which is Mount Whitney, just over 14,500 feet. Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on the planet at just over 29,000 feet. And so you can see that the mountains have a whole plethora of different shapes and sizes, and they range in heights all the way up to the tallest mountain in the Himalaya, which is Mount Everest. Again, that's the reason that that's the tallest mountain on the planet is the fact that you have two continents converging, and both of those are made of low-density rock, like we talked about in the plate tectonics lecture. Neither of them want to subduct, and thus they essentially crash into each other and crumple, and they thicken in the vertical direction. We may we think of, of Earth as relatively rough. 29,000 feet is an enormously tall mountain. The, the Marianas Trench is very deep. And so we think of the Earth as relatively rough, but in fact, if you took a cue ball and you inflated it to the size of the Earth, there would be much, much more topography on a cue ball or on a billiards ball at the size of the Earth than, for example, if we took Earth and made it into a billiards ball. It'd be remarkably smooth. And so although to our human scale, which, you know, we're anywhere from four, five, six, seven feet tall as average humans, to our scale on the surface of the Earth, it appears that there's a lot of topography. But really, if you think about the Earth as, as a whole and how thick it is, the undulations at the surface are really incredibly small. There's only about 12.3 miles of elevation change on Earth in general. And that's from the very tip top, that's Mount Everest that you see in the image in front of you, all the way to the deepest point in the ocean, which is the Marianas Trench, which is actually deeper than Mount Everest is tall. That means you could actually take Mount Everest from sea level all the way to its peak, and you could submerge it into the Marianas Trench, and you would still have a few thousand feet of water above you. All of that elevation change equates to just over about 12 miles of elevation change. And if you think about the diameter of the Earth, which is on the order of close to 8,000 miles, the Earth is remarkably smooth. And the mountains that we have on the surface of the Earth are, are come in a whole different uh, a range of ages. And they're all in a different time period in their evolutionary life cycle. For example, an, a, a mountain range that may be considered middle-aged or maybe adolescent would be something like the Rockies. The Rockies formed on the order of about 80 to 50 million years ago. There tends not to be too much uplift going on, although there still is occasional uplift in certain regions. But this is kind of a, a, an adolescent or maybe middle-aged mountain range. Compare that to, for example, the Appalachian Mountains. So the Appalachian Mountains formed hundreds of millions of years ago. There has been no active tectonic regime on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. for the last 
150, 250 million years or so. And so we have had this, this great mountain range that formed on the order of about 450 million years ago that now has subsequently had hundreds of millions of years of erosion with no more tectonic uplift. And what happens was what we think were mountains that may have been analogous to what the Himalaya are today. In fact, some studies have argued that the Appalachian Mountains may have been taller than the Himalaya, the present day Himalaya, which we are left with today is just the remnants of these mountains. The weathered away, you know, we're, we're looking at the surface a few, if not tens of 10 kilometers down, where all of the mountains above have now been subsequently eroded away, deposited out into the Atlantic Ocean. And all we're seeing now is the cores of what used to be an enormous mountain range. You can see it looks very different. We have gently rounded peaks. We have vegetation covering most of the landscape. This is a very old and mature mountain range that has now started to essentially be eroded and erased off of the surface of the earth. Con compare and contrast that with, for example, the Himalaya. The Himalaya are a young mountain range. These are This is a teenage mountain range, maybe even younger, preteen. This is a mountain range that started going up on the order of about 50 million years ago. Some argue that maybe it was a little, even a little later. But this is a relatively new mountain range. This has continued compression because India continues to crash into the the southern edge of, of the Asian continent. There is continued uplift going on. You can see these mountains are very, very steep. They have very craggly peaks. There's very little vegetation that has been able to take hold. There is a lot of, of erosion, but also a lot of uplift going on. This is a very dynamic system. And so this the, the, these three mountain ranges kind of span this evolution of a mountain range on the surface of the earth. Some key terms when we talk about mountain lifting, mountain lifting essentially involves uplift. That's just as the term implies, that's the upward vertical movement of the ground surface. You can't create a mountain unless you uplift rocks above the background surface such that you're creating something that has higher elevation. You also, in order to do that, you have to deform the rocks. So deformation means a change in shape or position or orientation. It can either be by bending or breaking or flowing. And there's essentially two things that, that deform rocks, and that is faults and folds. The three ways that we can essentially change the, the shape of a rock or, or the place of a rock, so the deformation of a rock, we can change it in location. That's a in the image that you're looking at. So that means literally displacing the rock. So remember in the image when we were looking at the mountain range in China that was displaced by the transform fault, those rocks weren't really being bent or, or deformed in any way. We were just taking half a mountain range and we were moving it away from another half of a mountain range. We're displacing the rocks. We're actually moving from one place to another. We can also have a change in orientation. That means a rotation. So remember, we looked at the tilted sequence of rocks and we said that that must imply some sort of deformation after the rocks were deposited because of the principle of original horizontality. And so if we start to see that rocks are rotated about an axis, that would imply also that there's been some sort of deformation going on. And then we can have a change of shape. So we also looked at this when we looked at the folded rocks because we accept the, the, the principle of original horizontality, any rock that is folded like this means that it must have been distorted after the rock was laid down in a nice uniform flat layer. And so this distortion also tells us something about deformation. The reason that things are deforming is because of the stress that is being applied. So the stress is the force that is being applied per unit area. So for example, in a convergent plate boundary, the stress is compression because the rocks are coming together. In a divergent plate boundary, the stress is tension. And in a transform plate boundary, the stress we call shear stress. We can also have the stress that we call confining pressure or pressure stress, which means that the the arrows of stress are equal in every direction. You can imagine taking a balloon and swimming down to the bottom of a pool with your balloon. The balloon maintains its shape, but it essentially shrinks in size a little bit because of the water is pushing on it in every direction. Stress 
is not the same as strain. So strain is the change in shape of an object in response to the deformation. So for example, if the stress is, is compression, the strain, or sorry, tension, the strain is stretching. If the stress is compression, the strain is shortening. And in the transform sense, when the strain, the stress is shear, we also call the strain shear. So let's take a look at those in a little more detail. Here is an example of our divergent plate boundary. I just like to use the block as an example so you can see your perfect cube as it goes through and a stress is applied of, of tension. That tension causes the cube to stretch and it causes it to shorten in the vertical and, and lengthen in the horizontal. In the opposite, where we have a convergent plate boundary and our stress is compression, our cube now also becomes a rectangle, but it, it lengthens in the vertical and shortens in the horizontal. And in our shear sense, in our transform plate boundary, when we apply the stress of shear, what we end up getting is a strain that we also call shear, and that would be taking our perfect cube and turning it into a ROM. A way of thinking about this also is maybe taking a deck of cards and kind of smearing them out along the table. We have to also now think about how the rocks are going to behave to these different types of stresses that will be causing these different types of strains. So at certain temperatures, the rocks will behave very brittly. That means that they will crack or fracture. You can think of that analogous to, for example, dropping a, a plate, take a plate, it's probably gonna be porcelain or ceramic or something like that, and drop it. And what will happen is it will shatter into lots of little pieces and fractures, and it will break in what we consider a brittle fashion. But at high enough temperatures, rocks will no longer behave in a brittle regime, but they will start to behave in what we call a ductile regime. And this ductile, or sometimes referred to as plastic deformation, implies that the rocks won't actually crack or break, but they'll actually bend and flow. And so you can think of this a little bit more analogous, for example, to a ball of something like bread dough. You take that bread dough and you drop it onto a table, or for example, take a book and drop it onto the bread dough. The bread dough won't break into lots of little pieces or fracture or crack. What it will do is it will actually deform and it will turn into this kind of pancake. You'll see have this ductile or plastic deformation and the dough will absorb the energy by changing shape. And so at some point, in the Earth's surface, because as we know, pressure and temperature go up as we go down into the Earth's surface, the rocks start to behave differently. We go through what we call the brittle ductile transition, and it's not uniform in any place, and we know that should be true because we know heat isn't uniform. If you're close to a volcano and you start to drill into the Earth, you'll see temperatures go up much quicker than, for example, if you're far away from a volcano. So there is a spread in how temperatures change, which we call the geotherm as we go into the earth. So there isn't any sort of defined boundary of the brittle ductile transition. It kind of depends on where you are, but as a general rule of thumb, it's occurring somewhere on the order of about 10 to 15 kilometers down. Somewhere around this depth, the rocks are becoming warm enough that the material is starting no longer to behave in a brittle fashion, but to behave in a ductile fashion. And what are the factors that control this deformation type? Well, one of them we just talked about is temperature, right? So as temperature increases, we start to move out of the brittle regime and into the ductile regime. Pressure is another one. For example, if you, t if you increase pressure very quickly, you can cause things to behave more ductily. And, and if, if you apply, or more brittly, I apologize, and if you apply pressure very slowly, things will be more ductile. Let's take an example of, for example, silly, silly putty. If you take silly putty and you start to pull it apart, now some of you that maybe are younger, maybe you never played with silly putty, but those of us that are a little bit older, before we had all these screens, silly putty was a great little time killer um, to play around with some silly putty, just essentially a little ball of, of, of goo that you can stretch and deform and warm up and, 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 and change and changes shapes. And as you pull it apart, it stretches and it will stretch really 
slowly and you keep stretching and stretching it, you'll get this little thin string and eventually it will break. But you can also take that silly putty and you can pull it apart really fast and you'll break it instantly. And so the amount of pressure and also the amount of deformation rate, how quickly you're applying it, both of those can also affect how things are behaving, whether they're behaving brittly or ductly. And then finally, it's the composition of the material. So how strong are the bonds will also have, a, 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 will dictate how this material behaves. One thing to remember is stress does not equal strain. The stress causes the strain. So stress is the force applied. Strain is the reaction of the material, how it's changing shape. Compression causes shortening. Tension causes stretching. Shear causes shear strain. Pressure changes size of the object, but not the shape. So here's again some of those examples, but now instead of just a block, let's think about, for example, a, 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 a solid piece of the, of, the, of the surface of the earth. Let's look at the right hand images. And those are analogous to the blue boxes and the red boxes on the left. So again, we're gonna start with a cube and we're gonna start with essentially a perfectly flat uh, 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 surface where we have a, a, the crust and it's just a perfectly flat surface. And we're going to apply compressional stress. When we apply a compressional stress, for example, in a di convergent plate boundary, what happens, as we talked about before, the horizontal will shorten, the vertical will lengthen. What does that mean in terms of the surface of the earth? That means that the surface will contract, come together, but the thickness will thicken. Thus, you will create uplift and you will create a mountain range. When we have the opposite, when we have a divergent plate boundary where our stress is tensional, the arrows are pulling apart, we have the opposite effect. We have that the crust will start to stretch. And what that causes is that instead of thickening in the middle, the, 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 the crust will actually thin in the middle. But that thinning will be accommodated by this normal faulting that we've talked about already a little bit that's associated with our divergent plate boundaries. And so you still kind of get these mountain ranges that form, even though you're not actually uplifting rock. What you're doing is you're actually kind of down dropping valleys and those valleys are filling in with sediment, but it appears as though you're creating these mountain ranges and these valleys. This is a great example of what's happening in the Southwest US. If you've ever driven, for example, from somewhere like Denver to San Francisco, as you enter what we call the basin and range in, in places like Utah, Nevada, you start to go up a mountain range into a valley, up a mountain range into a valley. And that's due to this stretching that has been occurring over the last few tens of millions of years as the Pacific plate has essentially been dragging a portion of the North American plate away. Uh, we think that on the order of maybe or so 20 or 30 million years ago, that Salt Lake City and San Francisco were actually really close to each other. And now they have been obviously pulled apart significantly. And then finally, our last uh, stress regime is our transform plate boundary where the plates are sliding past one another. Again, no vertical motion. Our cube turns into a ROM. And then here's an example that we talked about when we talked about metamorphic rocks, where we talked about our confining pressure. One thing to remember is that a joint is not a fault. So there's lots of rocks that have joints, and that's because rocks just form usually under pressure in the earth, particularly uh, intrusive igneous rocks. Then when they're exposed at the surface, they essentially no longer have that overburdened pressure of all the rock that used to be burying them. And so they kind of expand a little bit and they get all these joints in them. But a joint is not a fault. The difference between a fault and a joint is that a fault must have some movement along it. A joint will not have any movement. If a joint has any movement along it, if there's any displacement, we no longer call that a joint and we call that a fault. So let's remind ourselves about our two main fault types. We have our fault types that have a vertical sense of motion, which we call dip-slip faults. 
Here on the left, we see our two that are associated with a convergent plate boundary. We call these reverse and thrust faults. The distinction between them is the angle of the fault. If the fault is relatively steep, it's known as a reverse fault. If the fault is relatively shallow, it's known as a thrust fault. On the right-hand side, you see our dip-slip cartoon image of a normal fault that is associated with a divergent plate boundary. Again, remember, foot wall up normal, fun. This, again, has a vertical sense of motion and is associated with a divergent plate boundary. Here they are kind of in cartoon form, all three of them, and you can see that a real easy way to distinguish between the two is to draw a little person that crosses the fault. If the foot wall is going up, it's normal fault. If the foot wall is not going up, then it's either reverse or thrust. And then our other uh, fault type that is not associated with any vertical motion and is, is uh, indicative of transform plate boundaries are known as strike slip faults. And these come in two flavors, either left lateral or light right lateral. You can see on the left hand image, the little person that's looking out of the screen as they look across onto the other surface, everything has moved to their left. You can imagine them stepping across the fault and looking into the screen and everything also has moved to the left. Same thing on the right hand side image, everything has moved to the right, whether you're looking which in either direction across the fault. This is a left lateral and a light right lateral strike slip fault. The st strike slip fault system is what uh, is in the San Andreas fault. So this is an image of a fence line after the 1906 earthquake. Imagine yourself standing along the left hand side of the image with your back against the fence where the fence broke looking across towards the hills. The fence uh, where it broke has moved to your right. Now imagine standing on the right hand fence post looking out of the image towards you and again everything has moved to your right. The San Andreas fault is a right lateral uh, transform fault system and we can see that by looking at evidence of how uh, things like fences have broken during major earthquakes. We like to put our faults into these nice boxes and end members like strikes, like dip slip and strike slip. But one thing to remember is that nature is messy. And in most situations in nature, you don't have pure strike slip motion or pure dip slip motion. You actually have a little bit of both. So you may have uh, a, a reverse fault that has a little left lateral displacement like you can see on your on the left hand image or maybe a normal fault with a little bit of right lateral displacement like you see in the right hand image. So nature tends to be messy. It's easier for us to conceptualize these things into kind of boxes, perfect boxes, but understand that nature is pretty messy. So most of the time in nature we have what we call oblique slip faults and those are faults that have a little bit of a component of the dip slip and a little bit component of the strike slip. Where faults occur, they are very rough and they have an immense amount of energy. And that energy essentially breaks the rock types. And so one of the ways that we can identify faults in nature and rock displacement is by looking for areas of damage. You can see, for example, this damaged rock right in front of you, which we call a fault breccia. It's a, we call it a breccia because you can see how angular and how many different sizes there are in the blocks. So that means that this rock hasn't been moved from its location. It's probably an image of exactly how the rock broke and all these sharp angles. And so when these rocks start sliding past one another, they really it, release a ton of energy and that energy is sufficient to break the rocks and sometimes even actually melt rock to make that dark ground mass that you can see in front of you that eventually locks all those fragments in. And so one of the ways that we identify previous fault zones is by looking for these fault breaches. Another telltale sign of displacement or motion along a fault are what we call slick insides. So slick insides are very analogous to something that we've already talked about a little bit when we talked about plate tectonics. When we talked about glacial striations, remember Alfred Wegener as he was traveling around and, and observing uh, certain geologic and weather phenomena on the planet, started to notice something interesting where you notice these grooves in rocks that he postulated were formed by glaciers grinding over the surface. 
And so the reason that happens is because water has, has an immense mass. And so when you have a, a couple kilometers of glacial ice moving across the surface, you're imparting an, an immense amount of energy on the surface, the basal surface where the glacier is sliding over. And that's sufficient enough to essentially put these grooves into the rocks. The same thing is essentially happening in a fault surface. So in a fault surface, you have the immense stresses of two large plates grinding past one another. And as these faults move, they usually have a single sense of motion. And as they move in that direction, they grind the rocks. The rocks break and you saw the fault breccias. Those little fragments are essentially acting as little sandpaper and they're grinding these large striations and, and, and into the rock that we call slick insides. Another telltale sign of deformation is folding. Now we're, we're going to start talking a little bit about folding now as we, we're going to kind of transition into how rocks behave now below the brittle ductile transition zone. This is an image of Rainbow Basin in the Mojave Desert, which is a great natural laboratory to go observe some of these folds. So folds have a few terms that we use to describe and define them. The first term would be the hinge line. The hinge line is essentially the portion of the fold where the curvature is the greatest. We call it a hinge line, but you have to really think in three dimensions when we talk about earth science. So it's really more accurate to think of this more as a plane. We also have limbs on both sides so on both sides of the hinge line or the axial plane we have the limbs these are sides that showing that show less curvature than the the axis or the hinge here's the definition of that axial plane that surface that with that essentially defines the hinge line of each of the layers and the and the folds that that we see on earth come in essentially two flavors they're either concave down or concave up and essentially, or convex, you could think of it. So a concave um, or an arch-like fold that kind of looks like an A, we call an anticline. And one way to remember this is that the, the, um, the oldest rocks are in the center and the younger rocks get progress out towards the limbs. Here's a, a, a nice image of an anticline. This is an anticline from uh, Meteor Crater in Arizona. This is a, a example of a convex or, or a trough-like shape. And notice that this looks a little bit more like a smile. And this is known as a syncline. I like to think of anticline kind of looks like an A, syncline kind of looks like a smile. That helps me remember. Notice that now the youngest rocks are in the middle and they get progressively older as you go out. How do we know that? Well, we're gonna use the law of superposition. So the upper layer is in the middle and subsequently lower layers are out towards the limbs. Thus the youngest is in the middle and the oldest are out towards the, the edges. Here's an example of a syncline in nature. And the truth is, is that they usually don't occur as single units, they're usually all together. So if you just think of taking a piece of paper or your bed sheets and kind of crumpling them together, you would notice that you would have multiple anticlines and synclines forming together. And so here's an image of a syncline with an anticline followed by another syncline. In nature, you usually see these things paired up like this. Interestingly, when we have this type of folding that is occurring, we have this interesting ridge valley landscape that occurs. We talked about this already a little bit when we talked about the basin and range, but this is essentially due to differential weathering because you have the same rock types appearing on both sides of, for example, the hinge plane. If the hinge is in some rocks that are easily weathered, it will create a valley. And on both sides, if the on the limbs, if those rocks are resistant to weathering, you start to get these ridges and you can start to get through differential weathering, this interesting ridge valley association. It's very common in the, uh, uh, in the basin and range that we talked about. It's also pretty darn common in the Southeast. If you go to places, for example, like North, Northern, North, North Central Alabama, the Birmingham area and the Appalachian mountains there, you start to see the remnants of these folded rocks because the majority of the, the, the 
the brittle regime has been eroded, the upper surface that was acting in the brittle regime. So what we're seeing in the Appalachian Mountains is a lot of these large folds that were, you know, tens of kilometers below the surface and very warm and acting in a ductile or plastic, uh, 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 you know, in a plastic or ductile uh, deformation regime and now exposed at the surface. We can also have not just linear features like uh, folds, but we can have three-dimensional features like domes. So this is an anticline, but it's an anticline in every direction, right? Again, what you can see is the oldest rocks are in the middle and the youngest rocks go out to the outsides. Here is a dome. This is the classic dome. This is in Utah. And here is an example of what we would call a bowl. Now the youngest rocks are in the center, progressively get older as you go outside. Um, this is essentially synclines in three dimensions. And so if you see something like this, where it points to a two-dimensional image and it says that the youngest rocks are in the middle and the oldest rocks are on the outside, you can safely say that this is a basin. And if you see a feature, a two-dimensional feature, but it tells you that the oldest rocks are in the middle and the youngest rocks are outside, you can safely assume this is a dome. So this is a nice way of being able to essentially project three-dimensional uh, strata, what's happening in the subsurface in a two-dimensional map. Most folds and most domes are not, or, or basins are not going to be parallel with the surface. They're going to have some sort of angle to them. And when a fold, for example, has an angle to it, what we call that is a plunging fold. A plunging fold means that the hinge line is actually tilted. Thus, the fold actually disappears below the surface of the earth. Here's an example from Sheep Mountain in Wyoming. You can see this nice anticline where you have the, the oldest rocks in the middle, progressively younger rocks as you go out to the outsides. And the, the fold actually plunges down into the earth such that one of these hard sandstones encompasses it along its southern edge. All right, well, that's it. Um, thanks for tuning in to the Introduction to Earth Science Lecture Series, Lecture 9, about mountain building and deformation. Uh, we will continue this discussion in a few days. I'll be posting another lecture. Hopefully, I'll be doing these weekly now. We had a little bit of a move going on, and so moving a family is a little difficult, so I, I had a little bit of a hiatus. But if you're enjoying this, please uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel, follow along, share it on social media, uh, follow me at Matthew Wileke on Twitter, and please subscribe to my Substack, irrationalfear.substack.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.